Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Become a Guest to Apply. All right, so I have Dovell Bonnet on the line, and he is founder and CEO of Access Smart. Dovell, welcome to the show. Thank you, and howdy from Texas. All right. First off, love the hat, man. I want. I gotta have to get one of these for my for my Texas editions. I'm in. And uh, today we're going to talk about really the weakest link in cybersecurity. What that means specifically, not to spoiler it, but uh, we got to talk about passwords. Like, what does that mean? Two factor authentication. Should we be doing it? Is this stuff even safe on smartphones? Are we protected? I mean, all these. Um, great topics and things we'll delve into. But just to get us kicked off, we'll start with our Mission Matters Minute. So Dovell, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. Dovell, what mission matters to you? Well, what mission matters to me is cybersecurity and really blocking some of these hacks that are going on that are devastating companies, government agencies. And so many of these companies now are you know, buying products that uh, will secure their networks all behind the firewall. But they're leaving one area, which I call the virtual front door, wide open and available to the hackers. And at the same time, you know, we've got to go and fix that number one issue that 94% of the hackers get in through. It's also the area where a lot of companies and the IT people think is secure that isn't there. It's the one weakest link that everybody likes to blame, and that is password security. And yeah. where's the problem? Employee managed passwords. So that's what we want to fix. Mm-hmm. And we can go ahead and you can talk about different rules and policies and procedures, but really comes down to four things that a company has to think about when they're doing cybersecurity. First of all, you, of course, have the security and the compliance. That's all given. Everybody knows that. But what's often missed is the convenience, because when cybersecurity is inconvenient to the user, they will circumvent it for their own convenience. And at the same time, if cybersecurity is expensive to implement and to purchase, the business owners are going to delay doing that type of security. So again, you have to make it economical for even small companies to afford to put this stuff in. So this is what Access Smart is all about. We took all four of those principles and we wanted to leverage off of your existing technology that you're using. And certainly one of the biggest technology we all use is employee ID badges, the same badge that gets you into the building. Why not get through the virtual front door with that? So we build off of that so that this way you're not ripping and replacing the the investments that you've already made let's build on it so that's what we're doing that's what we're about that's awesome and uh, i love bringing mission-based entrepreneurs and executives on the line to really share like why they do what they do and your passion for cybersecurity obviously comes through on this line so excited to have you on the show and learn Thank more you. about access smart but um, let's start a little bit further back. So how did you get on this path to cybersecurity? Like where'd this journey begin? Well, I actually started from the technology side back in the mid nineties when uh, I got into a company and we first started to talk about smart cards. Mm -hmm. And if you're familiar with smart cards, that's the little chip that's in your credit card. And there were so many companies all talking about that this was the new wave of the technology of computers. Computers were all going to go to smart cards. So I got onto that early wave back then. I did stuff for the Olympics when it was in Atlanta, and I did things for other companies. Mm -hmm. And I just saw that the smart card was not something where you were going to store all your medical records and all your other information on there. It was your digital key to get access to all of that information. So that's how I started to get in there. But then the funny thing happened back in 99 2000, I got a call from a division of Motorola called Indala that does the physical access badges. And one of their big customers had had a security breach where they lost the source code to a major product of theirs. Wow. And the uh, Mike, uh, Motorola was asking, is there a way that we can ask 
you know, offer one card. And I said, yeah. And I started to show them how to do it. And I was hired then as their director. And yeah. that company was Microsoft. And they lost the source code to Windows 98. And so if you ever see a Microsoft ID badge, the blue ones with the gold yeah. chip in them, where they use those to get into the building as well as to get on their computers, I'm the inventor of that technology for them. Mm. And we took that and then we started to do other things, other companies with that same principle. And again, building off of the technology they already had. Mm. What kind of um, advice would you give to those that are out there that are considering a career, um, you know, in cybersecurity? Maybe they thought about it. Maybe they're thinking about like what their next step is. Because I just I mean, I've done a lot of interviews, interviewing different, you know, members of the cyber community community. And it just sounds seems to me like it's this huge, like burgeoning industry. And there's just so much opportunity. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, there is. I mean, there's so much to it and there's so many different parts to it that you can be, be a specialist in one area. I and mean, that's kind of what I do. I specialize in the multi-factor authentication password side of things, but there's a whole slew of other aspects and you don't have to always be an engineer. They're not looking just for engineers, but we also mm -hmm. need salespeople. We need marketing people. Yeah. We need all the other types of indices that are required for a business to be successful in this, just being able to describe it and to, to express it in a way that people can understand. And one of the things I have often seen is that you get the IT who love to talk geek. They know geek and they talk about <laughs> all of the issues and all of that goes over the heads of the CEOs. They don't understand yeah. it. And at the same time, the CEOs will start talking about um, ROI and return on their capital and all the other things, P&L list. And a lot of times the engineers kind of, huh, what are they talking about? So it's <laughs> also having those people who can bridge that gap. And being able to to express to both sides why cybersecurity is important to them. So you talk about um, about securing the front door, and you have this concept that I've heard you say more than once. And uh, you mentioned in the beginning of the interview. Like I want to expand on this because. Um, at first glance, it seems like obvious, but I didn't get it the first time. So securing the first door, uh, the front door. Um, tell me more about the virtual that. front door. The virtual front door. Yeah. So we all are familiar with the physical front door into the building, into the offices where we hold our badges up you know, like this and, and get in. <laughs> and we have all this other type of physical security that we put in. But now we're getting into this virtual world where we have the Internet, we have the intranet, we have web, we have cloud, we have computers, we have servers. I mean, all the things that we're doing in this digital age. And a lot of times we don't secure the entry into that. I mm. mean, we put the weakest link, the employee managed passwords. And I think we've discussed this before, but do you know what the number one password has been for the last six, if not more years in the industry? Uh, I do not know. I'm not even going to take a stab at that. Password? <laughs> That's number two from what I oh. see now. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. Wow. And so then they will say, well, you need eight characters. Great. They add seven and eight now to it. <laughs> and it's not because um, people or employees are want to be weak and they're trying to go and yeah. have really poor security. It's all about convenience. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have something in place that's convenient to use. And my team will come up with great policies, but... They look good on paper, but they don't mm. look as to how they're being implemented. And so it's really securing that virtual world that companies get into. And companies will do a lot of different things where, uh, like what they did with Target, where their HVAC was on the same servers as all of their mm. credit cards from their customers. So yeah. this is what we got to protect. That's what I really mean by the virtual front door. It's everything mm. on the Internet. So you say that passwords are secure, right? Like there's ways to make mm -hmm. secure passwords, but you hear sometimes the media, this idea of like password lists or, you know, kill the passwords or like, like, like what's your stance on that angle? Okay. A couple of things. One, when you ask somebody what's insecure about passwords, they'll say, oh, there are too many of them. 
or I've got to go and change them every 60, 90 days, yeah. or they're too long. And all of these different issues that they bring up, um, mm -hmm. those are not password problems. Those are password management problems. Mm -hmm. And this is where we have to get into it. So when you hear things about password less, well, yeah. or even killing passwords, and we'll get into this in more detail, I know later, but when you start talking about multi-factor authentications, there are three factors, something you have, something you know, and something you are. The something you know is knowledge-based, and that is passwords. You're never going to kill passwords mm -hmm. because you're not going to drop from three factors of strong authentication down to only two. Yeah. So passwords are always going to be there. But what you have to get rid of is the employee managed passwords where they're one, two, three, four, five, six. There's no reason you can't have a 20, 30, 500 character long password. Wow. But if you don't have to type it and you don't have to know it and it gets changed on you automatically and all you're doing is clicking to where you want to go, you don't care about that technology and passwords anymore. It becomes um, invisible to you. And that's what we're after. And so you look at some of these other solutions where they want to go biometrics. Okay. Everything has its pros and cons. There's no perfect solution. Yeah. Biometrics, you know, you can't change your eye. You can't change your fingerprint if it gets compromised. Yeah. So it's public knowledge. Um, passwords are actually the only form of authentication protected by the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Mm. Most people don't recognize that because you can't self-incriminate yourself. And yeah. a password is knowledge. These are kind of the different aspects of what I look at in uh you know, you're not going to kill password, password less going biometrics. It has its place, but it's not for everybody. And this is where I think passwords are secure. It's just that you now have to put IT back in control and managing those passwords. So you mentioned uh, multi-factor authentication and, uh, and, and I, I get it all the time now. I mean, social media is requir requiring it and everything from Facebook, all kinds of different things I notice um, lately. And, you know, especially on the smartphone, like, like what's your stance on, on MFA in general? A lot of MFA is not true MFA and what they talk about. The definition of multi-factor authentication you know, besides the three factors that we've already yeah. talked about, the have, are, and is, and no, is that true multi-factor authentication requires that you use two dissimilar factors. So mm -hmm. you can't have a no, no, or an RR. It has to be a no and an R or a have and a no, you know, things like that. Yeah. And when you look at the smartphone and the, the gatekeeper is the computer, it doesn't matter what I have and what I do and anything I have. The gatekeeper, the security is the computer. So it's yeah. what it sees that to let you in for the multi-factor. So great. I type in my password. That's something I know. Now I pick up my phone and I see a rolling code that goes by and says, okay. And I now look at, okay, I now know the number. And I type that in, but I know the number. So that's another no. So that's yeah. a no, no authentication. And at best, that is referred to as two-step verification, not multi-factor or two-factor authentication. The other thing is um, with the smartphone, and I don't know if you ever run into it. You know, I have certainly a few mm -hmm. times, but I sometimes forget to charge my phone. <laughs> and my Been phone there, is done that. dead. <laughs> Yeah. And so what? Now I can't get in because I can't use my phone and I've got to find the charger and then I got to wait. And so that lowers productivity and everything else while I'm waiting for that. Yeah. Um, it's something else to carry. And that's another thing I don't like having to do where you have multiple devices you have to go and carry about. And that phone never actually authenticates to the computer. You're not holding the phone up to a reader in the computer mm -hmm. to say, yes, this is legitimate. All you're doing is reading the screen and typing that in. Mm. So this is where I really go after the, the, the multi-factor authentication. And a lot of the new government requirements that you see coming out require true multi-factor authentication. Mm. And the, the uh, two-step verification doesn't meet that. So uh, let's let's switch gears a bit here. So I want to get into Access Smart. So you mentioned a little bit, but let's go further. So first off, just tell us about the company. 
Well, we're a startup company. Well, not a startup. We've been in business for over 15 years. Um, I was in the industry for a long time. I've been in smart cards for over 30 years now wow. and uh, have just been watching this going more and more and moving toward this. And I always felt that you know, the, the smart card can do so much more. Right. You, you know, we've gone to these credit cards now with the chips, but have you lowered the number or lessened the number of cards that you have in your wallet? I mean, we still got just as many cards in there. And that's the problem with the smart cards. Of it has the technology, the capabilities, but mm-hmm. it's now trying to get the industry to come together, all these different corporations to say, why not put multiple credit cards on that same same chip. And there's no reason you can't do it. You, why can't you put your driver's license on there? You can. It's all this stuff. Yeah. So this is where I've always come together on the smart card side and mm-hmm. combining more and more onto a single card. And the security that is available on these chips now is mm-hmm. phenomenal. And the encryption that's used that you don't have to worry about losing the card and somebody getting all your data and doing things. So it's just, this is where I've always started with this. And back when the attack occurred at Microsoft, Mm -hmm. this is when I decided, okay, I would need to get out on my own and Mm -hmm. just start putting this together. I've always been a visionary. And so that's why I left the corporate world and started this. And I also wanted to make it so it was affordable and doable for the small companies because they're the ones that get attacked the most. Um, 70, 80% of all attacks are after the small guys, not the big guys. And the small ones think, oh, well, nobody wants my data. I don't have anything important. Well, it's not that you're just after your data. They want to use you as the stepping stone to get to the big corporations Mm. and inject uh, malware into your products or Mm. use your certificates and your credentials to get into the next level on the next level. So, yes, you're a key part. And I know we talked about this earlier, but... When you see that a cyber attack now costs you know, a company over $4 million per incident. Oh, it's, my gosh. You know, a small company, when they get hacked, most of them go bankrupt within six months because of this. Man. And the ransomware, so I mean, it's scary stuff that's going on. But at the same time, it's doable. And mm-hmm. that's where we wanted to go with all of this and why I got into it. So you mentioned uh, you are, you're working with businesses, of course. Like, what type of clients do you find get the most uh, value out of working with you and your team? Are you working with like governments? Are you working with enterprise? Like, like give us a feel for because there'll be a lot of people watching this: executives, entrepreneurs, um, and otherwise. And I want to make sure that the right types of uh, individuals and organizations follow up because the cybersecurity issue. I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could all, you know, I could always say that, oh, let's take uh, the shotgun approach and say, if you use a computer, you need our product. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's true. But we have been focusing more on a few industries, certainly healthcare. The hospitals and clinics have been under ransom attack constantly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of this is to steal the medical, not to steal the medical records of an individual, but they're using that for research. You know, why have to go and uh, hire a lab to research a a drug when you could just steal personal data to see how people are doing with this particular drug? So there's a lot going on there. We also are doing a lot in law enforcement, which I thought was kind of interesting. And a funny story on this, we were doing one town where prior to us, uh, an officer saw some incident down an alley, so so mm-hmm. I'm told, and he got out of his vehicle and went after the uh, the problem. And mm-hmm. a couple of kids went by and saw an unattended police car with a computer. And hey, wouldn't it be really cool to go and steal the computer to have a police computer? No. And they did. Well, the city council decided that from now on, the police have to go and take their computers, their laptops with them whenever they leave uh, their vehicle. So you can imagine that same scene that the policeman is chasing down the criminal with a laptop under his arm, you know, if you you don't stop, I'm going to throw this at you, you know, (laughs) who knows what. And so. This is where we were able to use our tech, their smart cards, their access badges, and now they log into their computer with it, 
And, you know, all they have to do is just remove the card and the computer shuts down. It's all encrypted. If they steal it, it won't even boot up. So that's all good. We're doing stuff for the DOD. We're doing stuff for you know agencies within the U.S. government. We're doing stuff for manufacturing. So we're doing a lot of different companies. And a new one's coming out is insurance companies. A lot of companies are wanting to get cybersecurity insurance. Mm-hmm. And the agents are now putting on to these companies that if you don't have multi-factor authentication in yeah. place, you will not get a policy. Smart. So, <laughs> yeah. So this is where, yeah, anybody with a computer can use what we do. But at the same time, we like to focus in on a couple of key verticals. Mm-hmm. So take me through the the user journey of what what it looks like to use the product, what it looks like to get started. Because I know sometimes another thing is is you know people know something makes sense and they're just like ah, but w- like what's the startup? Well, like what is this going to take in terms of uh, resources for you know my team? Like how long does this take to implement? And obviously that's going to vary based on size of company, things like that. But and the problem, but um, I want to get a feel for just the user journey of what it looks like to implement this technology. Okay, so we have two components to our software. We have the administrative side and the client side. So let's start off with the client side. It's my belief that cybersecurity starts when you first turn on the computer. Mm -hmm. If you wait for single sign-on and after you're, you know, past the firewall, that's too late. Mm -hmm. The hacker's already in. So, you know, when you boot up a computer... Instead of having to type in your username, password, domain, Mm -hmm. now it just simply says, insert your card or tap your card. We can go contact, contactless technology. We don't care. But, you know, you take this card and you insert it into a reader that plugs into a USB port. Mm -hmm. And it will say then, okay, that's the first thing. Something I have. You've done that. If you can drop something into a reader, you're done there. Second thing is type in your PIN. That PIN just says, I know the secret to unlock the chip has yeah. nothing to do with any of your passwords. So once you type in that, that's your second factor, something right. I know. Now then the usernames, password domains all get injected into Windows. Wow. Okay. So now you're logged in. Great. You're able to use the multi-factor for that. And then we have a single sign-on component that you want to go to the web. You want to go to the Azure, you, you know, wherever else you're yeah. going on to the web. Okay. That's just a simple single sign-on program, which a lot of other companies have. Mm-hmm. But you brought up the smartphone and how that authenticates. And one th- area that most, um, all single sign-on do not do, and yeah. it's often missed in cybersecurity. While it's important to have secure log on and log in, mm-hmm. log on to the computer, log into your site, it's equally important to have secure log off. Oh. And people don't think about that. You don't want to walk away from a computer that is still connected to the network where somebody can come in behind you or a yeah. hacker can get in to tunnel the way in. With ours, you, you remove the card you're logged off or you're locked yeah. or you can even shut down the computer if that's what IT deems it happens. Mm-hmm. And to the user, they insert their card, they type their PIN, and then they double click what they want to go to. It automatically launches the application or the browser, yeah. goes to the website, fills everything in, and you just watch it all happen. Wow. And we can log into applications. We can log on to clouds. We can log on to websites. If it uses a username, password, Mm -hmm. 99% of the chance we're going to log in. And then we have the administrative side, which is, Mm -hmm. of course, only IT have it. And we believed, and I believed from the very beginning, that we should not be dictating to companies what their security policy should be based upon what capabilities a software has. Mm. Instead, we took the other route and said, no, you go and configure our software mm-hmm. to match your policies and procedures that you deem is appropriate. Now, we'll make recommendations, but they right. configure, IT completely configures the power log on system mm-hmm. and the employee can't change it. They can't circumvent it. They can't make yeah. their own policies. So all of that is managed. And now IT can go and change things mm-hmm. as they deem fit. Now, maybe passwords now need to be 40 characters long. They just mm-hmm. make it and automatically all your passwords now are converted into 40 character long passwords. Yeah. So that's kind of where we go. Now, you asked how long does it take? A typical install 
takes 30 minutes. Oh, wow. And that's it. So yeah. it's fast. It's very fast because yeah. we're not replacing anything. Mm -hmm. we're, we're building off of what you already have. You're not having to buy new servers yeah. and all. And we start everybody off with our starter kit. Mm -hmm. And this gives uh, the IT people everything they need to run a six-person pilot for 90 mm. days. And if for whatever reason it doesn't seem to work for them, then they just return it and they get their money back in full. Yeah. So that it's no risk to them whatsoever. And at the same time, then if it meets all of the requirements and they like it and it works, now yeah. they just have to go and say, how many cards, how many readers, how many licenses yeah. do I need? They mix and match depending on what their requirements are. If they, like we did for the DOD and for the government, they already have smart cards. They didn't need new cards. They didn't mm -hmm. have to re rip and replace yeah. anything. So it becomes very affordable. So, uh, I mean, first off, when I think about somebody who I'd want to implement a cybersecurity um, feature with, and, and the way that you've done it, you really, is a true MFA, right? The, and, I, and now I'm much more educated on this, and I hope my audience is as well. So something that you have, something that you know, and you have that, you have that physical card that you plug in. I mean, it just sounds very easy. And I'm not the, I'm not the most tech savvy, but I can do what you just mentioned. <laughs> I can do it, and I know I would never be running the tech side of it, but I shouldn't be. But I can do exactly what you said and it doesn't seem like a headache i feel like that's even easier than my normal headache of managing you know 50 passwords and oh what's the password the right one for this or what's the right one for that like it just seems like even for productivity and startup time and all that stuff and even just the back and forth with your with your it team saying hey i need this password reset or i need that password reset depending on what the system is maybe you don't have direct access i feel like this is also a big time saver for productivity for just your clients in general. Um, am I off on this? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, an employee wastes a couple of hundred hours a year. Wow. Just Hundred of typing, hours, couple hundreds, hundreds of hours a year just typing in passwords. And then if they forget their passwords, now they have to contact IT. 70% yep. of the help desk calls that IT typically gets is wow. resetting passwords. Well, you have if you've forgotten your password and waiting for a reset, you're sitting there doing nothing. So mm -hmm. you're not very proactive or um, productive at that time until you get your new password. Mm -hmm. So that costs the company company money. And when we looked at this from the business side, yeah. you know, there, there are three aspects that, I mean, there's more than just three, but yeah. there's three key aspects that most business owners and CEO care about. Mm -hmm. If I do this, how will it improve my revenue? Yep. If I do this, how will it improve productivity? If I do this, how will it improve our brand? Mm -hmm. And so we looked at it from that perspective too. So that if you use the power log on, how will it improve your revenue? Well, right. you're, you know, you're <clears throat> picking up new customers with that. You're not losing new customers. Mm -hmm. The customers, you know, the productivity side is increased because you're not right. losing that 700 hours anymore. You're not worrying about the hacks that are going on. I mean, just even the revenue side on that, you're not going to mm -hmm. be paying $4 million for a hack. And yeah. then the brand, seven, or is it 30 to 40 percent of customers now will leave a company that has been had a security breach yeah. and the cost of getting a customer right now you know is quite expensive yeah. and just all you have to do you can't afford to lose that investment mm -hmm. so this is where if you make cybersecurity a key mm -hmm. aspect of your business mission and you let your and let the world and the customers know this mm -hmm. those that leave those competitors will start finding you know finding you because you got a security brand that people are really more concerned mm -hmm. about so switching uh, focus slightly here. So you've also written a couple of books. I know one, um, the original was, was uh, I, I know the Dummies brand. So online identity theft for dummies. That was back in uh, 2008. So um, you've, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time, been in the industry for a long time. And now your, your most recent one, Making Passwords Secure. So I know this Making Passwords Secure book is still available. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the book and really just the inspiration behind what you want the readers to get out of it? Okay. Well, a lot of it had to do with, you know, always having to 
answer the questions about passwords and why passwords are secure and looking at it from both the technical side as well as the business side. And I wanted to come up with a book that just explained it in plain English. What is wrong with passwords and what is right with passwords? I mean, everything that everybody complains that what's wrong with passwords is really what makes passwords very secure and why you want to do it. But, you know, how do you use it? What is multi-factor authentication? You know, a lot of times you hear things about digital certificates. I'm going to get a little Mm -hmm. geeky here. Uh, I apologize. But you hear about public private keys and that's how digital certificates work. And the only thing that keeps digital certificates secure in PKI. It's not the algorithm and it's not how the keys are generated. It's how you protect that private key. And what do you do to protect it? Well, you don't let the employees know it and generate it. Oh gosh, that's what we do. You make them long and complex so they're harder to hack. Oh, wait a minute, that's what we do. And it's just a bunch of zeros and ones to the computer. So to me, a private key is nothing much more than a glorified password. So Mm. take the same principles that make a certificate Mm. secure to now make your passwords equally secure and not Mm. have to go and have that huge expense of training and blades on all the upgrades that you have to do. I mean, when you have a large turnover, you have to throw away a $300 certificate and buy a new one for the new employee that's coming in because you can't Mm. exchange them. We said, no, why don't we make our licenses transferable? So as wow. long as you have someone coming in and or someone going out and someone coming in, you don't buy a new license. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, what a solution. I, I feel like you've uh, you've really created a lot of win-win scenarios here and exactly the types of entrepreneurs and executives I like to bring on. Just they're adding value to the marketplace. You're adding value to the marketplace. And uh, and really, you're just uh, you're just the good guy in cybersecurity over here and, and really taking the most, in my opinion, like when you talk about securing the virtual front door, if you did that, then, you know, maybe the rest of the house is protected. So I just love what you've done. Um, I love the concept and even just even the even the model of what you just mentioned in terms of giving, you know, and treating it as a license and not and, and being able to transfer that license to a new employee, like all those little costs and things that you've done um, just show where your heart's at and that you're really trying to help the business owner and, you know, agencies out there, government and, you know, law enforcement. That's a great story about the laptop. I, I would have never thought about that. Like, who was the one that passed that one? <laughs> like, <laughs> you, grab the laptop and run after them. No, you got to yeah. worry about data security. This poor, this poor police officers like, how about my security, right? And how about the rest of the, and I have to secure a laptop. So, um, just feel like you're making a big difference out there. So I just have to ask Dobell. So a um, lot going on on your end. Cybersecurity industry is not getting any smaller. That's for sure. Um, and like, what's next? What's next for you? What's next for the company? Well, of course, the big thing that's going on in the cyber world and happening with everybody is we're all working remotely. We're all working from home. Yeah. And so it's we're now putting in the solutions to be able to do that, that Mm -hmm. you you can use a card, but you could use maybe a different kind of a token that you Mm -hmm. need for your home computer and home computers. You know, a lot of times you got your kids who are using the same computer and you don't know where they're going. Mm -hmm. So this is where you don't want them to know your passwords to get into Mm -hmm. your computer and all. So we're doing a lot there and we're doing this where. We've now made it to our licenses can be added to five different tokens. It could be on a card. It could be on a little memory stick. It can be on your smartphone, you know, whatever you're going to do. It's Mm -hmm. the same license you only paid once for. And you can be on as many computers as you need to and have your passwords with you. And when you remove them, they're gone. So we're not going and saying, oh, you can only be on this one computer to have security. No, I can go to any computer in my office complex here. I insert my card. Now that is my computer. Mm -hmm. I remove my card. The second person comes in, they insert their card. Now it's their computer and none of my stuff is available for them to see. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, again, just another another testament to what you're doing and where you're really at and, and making uh, security um, a thing for our small business owners out there. So, um, Dovell, that being said, if somebody's watching this and they want to learn more and they want to connect with you and your team, um, what's the best way for them to do that? We have a number of different avenues. Of course, we have our website, which is 
access and then a hyphen or dash smart.com. We're on LinkedIn. We have stuff on Facebook, or you can certainly email me at my first name, Devel, D O V E L L, at access hyphen smart.com, or call us at 949 218 8754, and we can set up a free consultation with you just to go over what you want. And a lot of times when I'm talking to a lot of IT people about cybersecurity, I'll say that. There's one common denominator that every network has, and you can kind of see them. They're leaning in like, oh, wait a minute. He knows the secret, and the secret is that there is no one common denominator. (laughs) So we have to go and listen to what are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? What are their problems? And that's when we're able to customize what they need because our software is designed to be customized. That's awesome. Well, uh, I, I will put all of that contact information, of course, in the show notes, make it really easy for our team just to, you know, go just click it, click on the link and uh, head right on over. So um, first off, it's been great having you on the show. I learned a lot. I hope my audience did as well. And uh, to the audience, if this is your first time tuning in with us or watching the program, uh, Mission Matters, we're all about bringing you great stories of, you know, mission-based and mission-centered entrepreneurs and executives and and sharing really why they do what they do, how they're adding value to the marketplace and to society. Um, if this is the type of content you like, don't forget, hit that subscribe button. We have many more um, mission-based individuals coming up, and we don't want you to miss a thing. And Devel, really, it has been a pleasure connecting with you, and I uh, can't wait to just watch more growth and see you do more great things. So thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure being here, Adam.